bless, bless. Hallelujah. I'm so glad to see all y'all here today. Praise the Lord. Hey, Amen. Looking around, seeing all the faces and everything like that. I uh, want to praise the Lord for all those in our, our Sunday school classes, as you can see up there. So it's a lot different than what it used to be, of course. But, uh, you know, we did make advances. So we did get 47 in there today. So Bible studies, Bible studies. That's, that's so important. That should be the, a, a major issue with us is just teaching that Bible. You wonder why people struggle in life? It's mainly because it's, it's more than just reading it. It's applying the Word of God in your lives. So if you look in your bulletins today, I want you to look at a couple things very quickly. Boop, boop. I'm stepping all over my brother today. So on Wednesday night, we need a nominating committee. On Wednesday night, we need a nominating committee. Wednesday night, we need a nominating committee right after services, right? And then also, uh, I want to invite you to this. So we're going to have a, a drive through Fall Fest, a drive through Fall Fest tonight. So the majority of you don't have kids come here. The overwhelming majority. We don't have children. We don't have family. So why do you do this? Why do we do this? So if, if we don't reach nobody, if you never have a contact with somebody, it's one thing to say you want to have, be a soul winner. It's another thing to have contact because you ain't going to win no souls if you don't meet nobody, right? So this, this is something uh, that should be enjoyable but your main mission in this is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Leslie, you want to say something about this thing real quick? Or somebody? So, yeah, Jessica. So, um, so tonight, we need, those that have agreed to, we're going to meet at 4 and start uh, the decoration contest. And we're going to get our booth set up. And then um, we're going to have some food trucks and So we're going to meet at 4 o'clock. Did I hear that correctly? 4 o'clock with those with the boot. And then we also, is there going to be hot cocoa here? All right. So, and then there's going to be some popcorn, right? So right across the road, you see that right there in front of the, the, the cemetery, they have those little slots. You can actually park there. And you could come and be an observer and a, a cheer on for those that are coming and working it. Maybe you want to be involved in it, be around the, uh, I think Miss Mary's going to be doing the popcorn, isn't she? You can sit around the popcorn machine for all I care. So we don't know if it's going to be an hour or it's scheduled for one hour, but if they still have people coming to it. They said they were going to keep going with it, all right, uh, to, to let it carry on. But we're going to be giving out some different things. We have some tracks, right? We have tracks. We have uh, some different things that we're going to be uh, passing out to reach people. Come and be a participant. It's not going to take a lot of your time. Be able to encourage those that are active. Uh, so I know Miss Mary's back there in the the, the nursery right now. So Miss Mary and I believe Christy's even back there. I'm not sure. Christy back there. So Christy and Mary are back there in the nursery right now. So uh, also I want you to look in there. We have Operation Shoebox. Hannah Sue, what about the shoeboxes? How many we got? Miss Sherry, how many shoeboxes? Miss Sherry, why should I do this? I mean, I mean, all we're doing is sitting just a bunch of gifts, right? Why should why should I participate in shoebox? Why? What's it matter?
So are you hearing that about a pencil? I don't know if you can hear me, Sherry, or not. One of the things is, like a pencil, they'll hide it. When these kids, kids get this, it, well, do they give them anything about Jesus, Miss Sherry? Rim shot. <laughs> yes. So we're going to let you see some of these videos here next shortly. Uh, they started a whole new program where they have more and more where they, they set up for them to come get it. They get the gospel presentation in their languages, okay, in their language. So around the world, it, it does make a difference. It's not, it's not just giving a little child something. It's giving them something for eternity. That's what it's about. Amen. A yo yo. All right. So, yes. Just bring your boxes. Yes. $9 shipping. I want you to consider it. Also, Lottie Moon's coming up. Even though it's COVID, there's souls that need saved. Please remember that. Pecan orders. Who's handling pecan orders? Anybody? Leslie, you want to talk to them about that? So deadlines today, they're ordering tomorrow. Uh, please... Uh, get that taken care of today. Uh, that goes into our children and our youth, right? So that goes in both ministries. All right, so they can go to camps in the name of Jesus this year, right? Um, Margaret Lackey, um, I don't have a number on there yet. How much has been given for Margaret Lackey? Do what? Miss Mary, do you know? Nothing. No, so this is what COVID does. This is what COVID does, because everybody's good people here. We have $1,000 go. I want you to consider giving. What does it do? What does Margaret Lackey do? That's our Mississippi State Convention uh, offering. Did any of you ever go to a junior college or a college? Did you ever hear of BSU, Baptist Student Union? It is supplemented by Mississippi, the Margaret Lackey, offering. Have you ever heard of the children's home? Anybody ever give to the children's home here? Margaret Lackey offering. Have you ever heard of the Baptist Hospital in Mississippi? Margaret Lackey offering. Have you ever heard of our associational office? They're supplemented by Margaret Lackey offering. Uh, we have somebody into the, the Indian Reservation. Margaret Lackey we have all across the state of Mississippi, including, it's going to sound strange to you here, they have Baptist plants in Mississippi that are sponsored by Margaret Lackey. We don't let COVID keeping you from bringing a blessing for somebody's soul being saved. Amen? Y'all good? Everybody's good? Hey, don't be looking like y'all been watching elections all week. Jesus is still on the throne. Hey, don't worry about all this stuff. Let the Holy Spirit bring some joy into you because it's all going to be okay. We have any other announcements? All right, Brother Ellis, would you open us in prayer, please?
We got all of that through with now while those children are going to their church, but well, we'll just all stand together and sing, Set My Soul Afire, Lord. Seated. Our next hymn is Foot Higher Ground. I'm pressing on to that higher ground. Number 484, if you want to look at it in your book. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Ah! 
next one is Trust in Jesus. I hadn't sung this song in a long time and tried to find some that we hadn't sung. And this is a good, good, good hymn, Trust in Jesus, number 417. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trust in Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the day. third verse there you know that it's got such a great message in there trust in Jesus simply trust in Jesus singing in my way Sunday, Miss Natalie was supposed to brought our special. We hope we get this thing through today. <laughs> She's going to come and bring our special music. Check. Tell me what does it look like in heaven? Is it peaceful? Is it free like they say? Does the sun shine bright forever? Have your fears and your pain gone away? There's a 
I knew that story. Um, I'd heard it because it's Fish's wife, I believe, is the one that told me that. But I'd heard that story before and stuff. And <coughs> but I understood what you were saying, Miss Sherry. I knew. It. That's okay. And I'm, I'd rather you clarify it because that's the truth. All of it is is strictly to get into somebody's life. We take so much for granted. We we do. Good people are doing good things. I was thinking about this song, sis. So, uh, after sis had left last week, she had left her little thing up here with the music. Now, that's the most popular. Uh, now, don't misinterpret me because my wife always gets on me how I say stuff. It's the most popular uh, funeral song. So, every funeral song I do right now, uh, especially in her age group, which is bearing our grandparents and different ones, um, that's what they play. Now, as you listen to that song, there's, there's different statements made. The most important thing is it talks about, I hope, these, I hope, I hope, I hope you're dancing in heaven. I hope. You know, there's only one way we're going to make a difference where you can have the peace that it's talking about there. That individual, when she wrote that song, she was mourning at the loss of someone in her family. And when she wrote it, she was thinking about what she hopes it's like up there. And your hope is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Your hope is that we get to deliver them the message of Jesus right here. Now, I got to do, unfortunately, I do lots of funerals. It's a part of life. You go to, you go to uh, people being born, and you go to funerals. I go to hospitals. We used to before pre-COVID. And I've watched and I've looked in so many families' eyes, and I've thought about this song now since I read it the other day. I read it after you left. You know, the only difference that you're going to make in this little old church that will make a worldwide difference out of everything that you're going to do, out of everything you're going to do, is knowing who your hope is. Not just the name, but about Jesus Christ. Sometimes as church, we, we push so many different things. Uh, we, we push stuff. But if the stuff does not lead to Christ, I like the Christmas box because I seen what people got saved. I like the Margaret Lackey offering because I know personally people that were touched by that offering and, and people reaching others with Christ. And I've met the children in the children's homes. I like um, the fall festival. I hate Halloween. So in case y'all didn't know that, uh, how many times I've said that over the last six years? I hate, hate, hate. Listen to me. Despise Halloween. Now, I know that's one of the most funnest things around here. But see, I've had people that I've been involved with, so I know both sides of this coin. The most important thing that I can give you today is the truth of Jesus Christ. The most important thing that you're ever going to do is that Bible that you have in your lap, I hope, or if you don't have one, right on the front of your pew, there's a red one right there on it should be in your pews. 
and to know the Word of God so that when you have an opportunity, you can present somebody with the gospel message. I do not want to ever wonder if somebody made it to heaven. Because there are, are any of you haunted by people you're not sure if they made it into heaven or not? Because everybody tells you that they've made it to heaven. You ain't never went to a funeral where I got up there and preached that they went to hell. It's, you wonder though, and then it, it causes a burden. It causes a burden in your heart because we all want to know that this is not the end. Now, as a born-again believer, it's more than being no pastor. It's when I made a decision for Jesus Christ is where I found a difference in my life. It's where the transformation took place, and it, it, it was so different, is that the Holy Spirit led me to go to reach out to people with the gospel. The most important thing I'm ever going to do could be presenting this message today to you. Because without Jesus... You're not going to be there. You're not going to be hearing any angelic choir. You'll hear something else. Without Jesus Christ, you're never going to know just what everybody's desiring. You know what they want to know? It's how, can, how can I have something that's a better life, a good life? It even talks about it in the Word. Sometimes we get in such a routine uh, of just going to church but we never experience what those preachers and them other knotheads are talking about because we don't understand that word. That's why we push Bible studies. That's why we push getting into the word. And that's why we push, that's why we push to know what we're doing. So sis over here, she sells this. What's the name of that stuff you sell over there? I ain't trying to promote it. I'm just, I find it interesting. I find it interesting. I, I tell Christy all the time, all, all these girls around here are selling into this stuff. So the most important thing, though, is they're very passionate about what they're doing. Make good advertisement. And you know what? I was thinking, man, if I could be that passionate about Jesus. They, they sell it now. I don't know how much you sell them. I don't know. They got all these things. But they sell that stuff. And they, get on, they use technology that I'm not good at. We only have a short time, y'all. With everything that you're concerned with, the most important thing that we should be concerned with is whether people are going to go to heaven or not, whether they know Jesus Christ. And my brother, he put my scripture up there today, Jeremiah chapter 6. If you can stand with me, I want to read you this scripture, and, and I've actually read it here before. This is, this is one of them. I, I, it's a reminder to me. It's a reminder to me. It says, this says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. Now watch, because I, I want you to see the scriptures in here, and I want you to picture this, someone talking to you. Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. I want you to highlight this, where the good way is. You ever wonder where the good way is because you don't feel like it ain't too good sometimes? So this is telling us where the good way is and walk in it. And he says don't just look at it, don't just know about it. Walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, now here's the thing. We will not walk in it. So if I tell you, I know the path that leads to paradise. If I tell you, I know the way that leads to heaven. If I tell you, I know a way that'll heal your marriage. That'll change your financial situation. If I told you the way, would you walk it? Would you travel it? Or would you stand back and say, I ain't going, no, I don't care what you say, Jack. I'm actually talking to Jack. I don't care, Jack. I ain't going to go that way. I ain't going to do that stuff. And 
And that's what you're seeing today. Let's pray. Father, as we come, we come with open hearts, open minds to seek your face. Lord, you're a healer, redeemer, life changer, transformer. We pray today, God, that the Holy Spirit would fill this place, that you would speak to each of our hearts, and that, Lord, when we walk, that we walk the path that you have for the good life. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. So no matter where I go to in my life, I have been and I've done lots of different things on funerals and all sorts of stuff. Every single age group is looking for the path that's going to lead to happiness or joy or peace in their life. They're looking for what they consider to be good. And if I come in here, uh, there's going to be several different interpretations of it. Uh, one, one guy at a certain age, he's going to say, man, he's going to look over there at somebody who's retired, and he's going to say, I cannot wait till I get to the good life where I can retire. And yet the guy who's retired saying, I wish I could go back to that age so that I could enjoy the good life. You see a child, they look up and they say, I can't wait till I get out of school so that I can have a good life. I was watching this little girl cry the other day. It just broke my heart, you know, because, you know, me, I, I, I want like 5,000 little grandbabies. That's why I love all the little babies and stuff like this and this little girl she was just crying she was crying and she was so upset she says her mama says well, what's wrong my baby she says life is so tough she's like three years old or something and she was up there and she had long little brown curls and those big old tears was just shooting out of her face she says what what's so tough about it she says there's just so much work to be done and she about had me crying. I'm up there saying, what in the world is this woman doing with a three-year-old making her work so hard? She says, there's never an end to the chore. I got so many chores to do, I can't have fun. I was thinking everybody in their lives are looking for something that's good, something that's different, something to make their life better. They're seeking the happiness by, by, by different ways. Uh, we tell our children, if, if, you, if you go and you get more education, then you're going to have the best life because then you can make the most money. And yet when you look in the scriptures in Ecclesiastes, right? What's that say back there, Dwayne? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 18. He says, because in much wisdom there is much grief. And increasing knowledge results. And what's that say? In increasing pain. Well, ain't that the opposite of what I've been telling that youngin back there? Nathan, ain't I been telling you something different than that? See, a lot of times we don't look at it from a spiritual perspective. You can gain a lot of knowledge, but here's what it comes to. If you don't know Jesus Christ, it still is going to have pain in your life. People who increase the knowledge, basically what it's saying is your, your sorrows can increase also. Others see the good life as a pathway of, of just getting over there and enjoying the pleasures, the, 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 like that little girl. She, there's, there's so many chores. I just, I just want to go play. So many people want to play in life. They want to have a life where they can go out there and just enjoy it. They believe that the main purpose for life, and I guess you could say that comes from a Cajun background, is, is to eat, drink, and be merry. There's nothing like going to a Cajun crawfish bowl and everybody's sitting around and they're laughing and they're cutting up and stuff like that. But is that the ultimate goal? See, the wise men of the Old Testament, they found life, <laughs> they're so strange, to be empty and unsatisfying. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1, and, and then we'll look at verse 2 also. It says, and I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself and behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness and a pleasure. What does it accomplish? See, all these things are, are written here, and it's, it, it's telling us there's so much more to life. So many people are mistaken that the idea of happiness is found in the accumulation of the stuff that I possess. And I've known them. I've known people that had literally, you know, you've heard me say before, literally just room after room of antiques worth multi-thousands of dollars. I've seen jewelry like you wouldn't believe. I've seen diamonds. I've seen rubies. I've seen emeralds. I've seen houses filled with things that people want and, and gigantic. I've seen showers that you could park 
a car in and use it as a car wash. Literally built by very good friends. But you know what? It still don't bring happiness. The wise people, they, they even found that, that all the wealth and the fulfilling uh, works, that they don't satisfy the deepest hunger that's based within you, that's built inside of you for a heart of the good life. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11, and we're going to read a few more. It says, Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labors which I exerted, and behold, all of it was vanity. Now listen, and striving after wind, and, and there was no profit under the sun. Now, isn't that something? Thus I hated, now watch this, I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Now, now let me ask you, as you're going along here, and you're thinking some of you that are a little bit older, and, and you're getting to that age, and you're building stuff, and do you ever wonder what they're going to do with your stuff? How they will, it took you so long to gather it. Do you think maybe the good Lord had this recorded for a reason? Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. So have any of you ever seen uh, accumulation of properties and yet when that person died before they even were uh, put down six foot six, their property was sold? I've seen it. I've been there. So how do I achieve what's a good life where I don't have to worry about my stuff? I don't have to worry about these things because God is giving us a plan. He's telling us how to achieve it. The good life begins when you decide that God is actually a real individual and that he's in control of all. He has to be real to you. Now, all of us claim that God is real to us, yet we do not really follow after him as he actually exists. It says in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, Jesus said to me, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So the only way you're going to know the Father, the only way you're truly going to know uh, happiness is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and he's going to lead you to make decisions that are godly. Until God becomes real to you, life is going to be incomplete. So what do you mean by that, Kyle? I'm telling you here today, and I'm probably preaching to the choir, but actually there's so many people who claim God, yet their life is pursuing everything except the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. Life is incomplete. It's, it's an unhappy. You can get married, uh, get married and be unhappy. You can make money and be unhappy. You can have stuff. You can go to college. You can do all sorts of things. You ever know anybody who spent years and years and years in college, yet they never even did the job that they studied for? because it didn't make them happy. I have a dear friend who has a law degree, a lawyer. Wouldn't that make everybody happy? Your son or your son-in-law, your family member is a lawyer. Do you know what he did? He graduated, he started practicing law, and he quit it because he was so unhappy. And you know what he started doing, Brother Ellis? Is he started building houses for a living. He says, that is where I find my satisfaction at. He says, that is where I'm happy at. He was always sitting in the church. He said, there were so many things that were pulling at me that led me away from my scriptural belief. See, each one of us have a God-shaped vacuum in our lives. Have you ever went and got blood drawn? And when you go up there, they stick a needle in your arm, and, and they have this little vacuum tube that usually fills up with your blood. You have something in your life that is empty that can only be filled by the presence of God himself. You can't find the things of satisfaction. That's why we have so much turmoil in the homes today. We have so much turmoil on the schools today. We have so much turmoil in all of our lives because we have not pursued the one, the truth, Jesus Christ to make us happy. We just want just a little bit of him. We just want a little taste of him. But we don't want what fills us up and completes us. We always have a reason of something else we can do. 
We always have a reason of some place we can go. We always have something else. That's why people have a bad taste in what things that God said should be good for us. We get injured because no one, nothing, not nothing around you will ever make you happy until you're happy with Jesus Christ. That's where the satisfaction comes in. If you see all the creation and you look at nature and you see all the trees and you go to the redwood forest, I've had lots of friends and, you know, they went and seen these gigantic trees and they saw all of what is out there to see travel the world. I have a family member, he actually went around the entire world, sometimes twice a year. But he wasn't happy, he committed suicide. Well, doesn't that make you happy? He had enough guns, Brother Ellis. You know, everybody around here wants gun safes. He had gun rooms. Well, you know, like the 007 movie where you go up there and it has that wall that goes, bzzz. he had so much money that the wall went, bzzz had a library, and he had every kind of gun, every kind of uh, uh, a gadget we cannot imagine. I didn't even know you could get. I don't even know if it was legal or not. Yet he spent his life alone and in misery because the God-shaped vacuum in his heart was not filled with God. It was filled with stuff. He saw the wonders of the world, yet his heart was empty. You can study all the philosophy and you can take those classes and all you can do is come to the intelligent that God is intelligent. No matter what college you go to, the one thing you're going to study is that nothing can create from nothing. Yet here it is. It all comes from the existence of God of creation. Yet everybody says, there is no God. We only could come to know God in that personal way of, of knowing him as that loving father uh, through that faith in Jesus Christ. I was thinking about this as I was studying. I was looking at the word, though. So many people do not have what's a, a, a meaningful relationship with a loving father because the fathers have left their accountability and responsibility. We have taken it where really people think the only ones that should be in church, uh, and it's a great thing, I'm so glad they're here, women, but where's the dads? Pursuing something to fill their empty hearts. Pursuing after those things that they believe will make them happy. And until they have that personal knowledge of Jesus Christ, I've sat with children that are older children. They would be in their 30s and 40s by the time that I had, they, they'd come and spoke to me. And they were pursuing a relationship with somebody. And then when they went there, they were so disappointed because their dad wasn't who they thought they were going to be. You know, the great thing about God is he is the personal dad. I had somebody, a, a young lady, and she told me, she says, I never had a relationship with my pop. I never had a relationship because he had this problem, this problem, all these different things in his life. And she says, I always said, I needed that. I needed that. But she said, but until I had that relationship with Christ, I was always seeking something or someone to fill my empty heart until I had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. See, the good life that's described in the Word of God is following the path. The path of the Word of God. Following that will of God. It says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. I want you to get it now, because this is the part we forget. Which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. So I want you to look at it. I want you to look at what it's saying here. I want you to take this word from the page. And I want you to put it in your heart. And I want you to think about it. Is your life pursuing more of the world or more of Jesus Christ? Because what we see in, is more conformity to what the world says right. 
That's why you see denominations just sliding down the tube because everybody's trying to conform to the world. We're not to conform to what the world says. We're to conform to Him. And what's going to be so hard, what makes people struggle, is they're more concerned about what the world says, their neighbor says, their friend says, than what Jesus Christ said. Don't be conformed to what the world says. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. So do you know what the will of God is for your life? That which is good and acceptable and here's the key word and perfect so what's wrong why can't we have the good life the good days why can we not have it it's because we don't find what's acceptable and perfect and this is what we always say nobody's perfect do we not say it the will of god is perfect for your life paul what he he said to these uh, these individuals, uh, the followers of Jesus Christ at Rome, when he had wrote them a letter, and he, he gave them two essential disciplines that we have to have in our lives that's necessary to, to prove in their own experiences what the will of God is. He says, this is what you've got to do. If you're going to have what's good and acceptable and what's perfect for the will of God, this is what you need to do. He says, one thing is you've got to dedicate your entire body to God. So, the question is, is your body individual? So we always said, when, you know, I'm from the old school where it says, this is the temple of God. What I put in it matters. What I do matters. It's for the glory of Jesus Christ. We sang it in Sunday school. We went to vacation Bible school. But unless I apply it in my life, I'm never going to have the good life that he told me is possible. Now, this is an external condition right here and for the discovery of how the will of God is for me. If I say, is this God's plan for my body? Is this what God desires? See, what happens is, is we make exceptions, do we not? We make exceptions of what I'm going to do with my body, where I'm going to place my body, how my body is going to react. Flesh always has its own plan for satisfaction. That's why I wrote that song. Can't get no satisfaction, right? I know y'all want to buy my records. You can have it too. We'll have a special after church. And the reason you can't satisfy it is because you're trying to feed the beast instead of the Holy Spirit. You're trying to submit your life to the beast instead of God. And until we're willing to let God, that it, ma it matters. You know, don't you think about it. Typically we say, I don't care what anybody thinks. And the, the, the key word when you say anybody is anybody. Because what we're saying is, is we don't care what the Holy Spirit says for us. We, we don't care what God says. No, we, we won't word it that way. What we do is we look out here. But the truth is, is my body is to bring praise and glory to God. So is our bodies at the disposal of God or not? It's impossible to find the good life. It's impossible to find the happy life. It's impossible to discover what God says. No, God is who he said he is or he ain't. So if you call yourself a born-again believer and you truly believe in God, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that you've truly repented and accept him as your Lord and Savior, is your body under his control or is it under your control? How good is God's will for your life? God's will for your life is perfection. That's why we struggle. Now, it says in the Word right here, also, that the, the renewal of the mind is, is the external condition. See, so I, got an in, uh, I have a, the, this external, I have an internal, which is renewing my mind. So my external is my body. The renewal of my mind is the internal right here. And that we have to meet to discover the, the good life, the dedicated life for the bringing the glory to Jesus Christ to do the will of God. And that's the part of that path. That's the path of righteousness. That's the path that God has for us that leads to the good life. So in other words, it's not my thought process. Because my thought process is always just like the flesh to achieve its own desires and its own happiness. And until I place 
the, the worship, the, play, the praise, the glorification of God into my life. I will always pursue my own way, and I will teach it to the generations that follow after me that your way, your path, what you decide is right. So when you look out there, some of you older people, and you say, this world's went crazy. This world has went crazy because we did not lead the pathway. We got to lead stones of remembrance so that people will follow the true path. That renewal of my mind is the transformation to say, you know what? We always put them braces on years and years and years ago. Think about how many years ago. What would Jesus do? And what would Jesus say? And how would Jesus handle it? So following the will of God is going to that pathway that he has for me. So Paul, he, what he does, he, he places us be, before a program. He says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. Yet we consume the things of the world. We fill ourselves. We fill our heart. We, we put pornography. We put the alcohol. We put the drugs. We put all those things before God. We call it because we're not under legalism. But God said, be ye holy as I am holy. And the next thing he does, he describes this process. So, so people don't naturally think the thoughts of God. We have to accept the thoughts of God. You, you think uh, Jesus is worried about this election? Boy, y'all ain't talk. What is wrong with you people? Are y'all awake? Do you think that this all shocked Jesus Christ? Woo! My goodness! The Democrats have taken over and they stole the election. Do you think that shocked him? And what do we talk about? I need more guns, I need more ammo. Thank you, Jesus, for my 30 out 6. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, that I got my grenades prepared because I'm going to hold the evil at the gate. Think about it. You see, we read these words and we pass over them so lightly. Are my thoughts the thoughts of Christ? Or are they more about what I think is right or wrong? What I believe. Let me tell you something. God, with all this stuff, I was reading history. I was telling Ellis earlier. I'm going to give this to you for free so we won't even count this on the clock. So I was reading history and stuff about where Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And when he was assassinated, this one, it was a general who went before uh, and he went and he spoke and he, he gave a testimony. And, and it actually, a lot of it came from him quoting scriptures. And I had to go in there and study it. And I was looking, he's talking about we live in a dark and a, a dangerous time. And he was going on. But when it was all said and done, and he's on this front porch talking about the assassin, assassination of the president, he says, but God is still on the throne. Let me tell you something. No matter what takes place, I ain't telling you I'm happy with the election. What I'm telling you is God is still on the throne, and he's still in control. It don't matter what anybody says or anybody does. God is still on the throne. Now, here's what was interesting about it. Sixteen years later, after this man spoke, he was elected president, President Garfield. One year from the day he was elected president, guess what happened to him? He was assassinated. And you know what? God was still on the throne. God's still on the throne. And what we have to do is we have to let the Holy Spirit come in and reshape us, remold us to recreate within me something that brings the glory of God, that mental attitude, that mental attitude where, uh, that, you know what, since the, the fall of humankind, there has been evil in this world. Evil deeds have been done. But the ones that are sold out for the glory of Jesus Christ are more concerned about what Jesus wants them to do than we are what your Facebook has to say. So Paul, he comes in here and he talks to us about the purpose for the renewal of mind so that I can discover in, in my own experiences what God's will is for my life. 
And when I discover the will of God for my life, then I will go the right path. Let me ask you, have you been going down the wrong path? Have you taken those paths that have always got you a thorn in your foot? Have you always been in that place where there's always hurts? Re-examine yourself. We all have to. I have to. Because if I'm not careful, my flesh will always divert me. You can go in the woods and you will have a a, a natural inclination to turn to your left or to your right. Most people get lost because their inclinations are always going in the wrong direction. But you know what never changes? The sun is still rising in the east and setting in the west. There's no way for us to discover the good life apart from that deep dedication to the will of God that I'm, I may not like everything that, that takes place, but the question is, does it bring glory to God? Are souls saved? Are lives transformed? Is there a way that it can be used for the glory of God? Is there a way for my life to be in submission to the will of God? Am I doing His purpose? The good life. What it does is it requires that discipline. And that's what we hate. It requires, no matter, all along my way, so I'm 56 years old, and I still have to submit myself to discipline. We were, we were talking on Wednesday night and studying the book of Hebrews, and it, God says, I, I chastise those I love. In other words, I discipline those I love. So there's two sides to the coin. If you're not being disciplined, there's a reason, because you must not be a child of God. God is always going to keep us in line when we get out of the way. And what's funny is sometimes we get out of the way and we don't even, we don't react when the Holy Spirit's trying to convict us. So we can make the plans. We can make great plans and and, and we we have a habit of doing it. And we can have a splendid vision of what could take place, of the, the ultimate destiny of trying to transform things around us. But if it's not in the will of God, if it's not following the will of God, it don't matter what you build. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much is in your bank account. Uh, we're so self-deceived if we believe the desire alone is all that's necessary for achieving success. You can start things, but did you start something to bring glory to God? See, that's every aspect. He says, I don't want portions to you. I don't want the little piece of you. I don't want just the leaf. I don't want just the flower. I want the entire Peace. On all of you, all of, of our whole lives has to be in surrender to the, the activities and the, the, the goals and, and the order that God brings into our life. Any worthwhile goal in life is under the submission of God. So the whole writer of Proverbs, when you look back in the book of Proverbs and stuff about the processes processes of of voluntary self-discipline look at what it says right here we're going to read through this real quick and i'm just going to go all the way through them and it's going to have the scriptures it says all the ways of man are clean in his own sight and watch all the ways of man are clean in his own sight but the lord weighs the motives commit your works to the lord and your plans will be established he will walk he who walks in the uprightness fears the lord but he who is devious in his ways despises him Listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. He who neglects discipline despises himself, but he who listens to reproof acquires understanding. When you look at these scriptures right here, the whole, the, the, that writer of Proverbs, is he's talking about, all right, this is the processes. These are the processes to go the path that God has for us. So the, to, the pathway to the good life, it, it, inclu- it includes that determination to stay on the way, to run the race, to keep on the path. It's not enough to know the path that leads to the good life. I can say, I know Jesus Christ. I, I, you know, he, I got a road right here, and I know that le- road is going to lead to a good place. It's going to lead to a beautiful place but if i do not get on the road where do you end up at 
You can admire that pathway that leads to the good life. You can say, you know, that's a great thing. That's a good way to be. That's a good way to think about it. But until you plan to choose the pathway to the good life, in other words, I'm not just talking about, I know that there's a plan. Get the plan and put it into action. And until you do that, you won't have it. We got to be determined. Every day is a new day. Every day that you wake up and you draw a breath, praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have another opportunity to bring praise and glory to his way, to walk in the way, to know his way that leads to the right destination in life. You want to know the way? Follow Jesus. Accept his plan. Let him discipline you. Don't think of it the wrong way. Think of, thank you, Lord, that you love me so much that you're willing to get my attention. Has he been getting your attention? As Brother Raymond and all the musicians come down and they're going to play an altar call song. Let me ask you, what path are you traveling on? He's telling you the, the good way. The old, you know, think about it, the old path. So I say that, people get turned out. Oh, I hate that old time stuff. No, he's talking about Jesus. The old paths are following the rays of righteousness. So, examine yourself. Is my body in submission to God? Is my mouth in submission to God? Are my thoughts in submission to God? Do my actions and deeds bring glory to God? Am I going to heaven? If you don't get saved, you'll never get on the path. If you are saved, all you got to do is get on the path. So as the Holy Spirit moves today, I would ask that you respond to what God is speaking to you. May you be strengthened in the Word. May your path be lighted. May your days be long and joyful and happy. And may you dance in heaven with Jesus Christ. May you be hearing the angelic choir. Eternity is a long time. As the whole Holy Spirit speaks, won't you come today? The cross upon which Jesus died Won't you think about it? Is a shelter in which we It's grace so free is sufficient for me and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's still room for you there's room at the cross There's room at the cross.